In this video, we're going to take chi-square and we're going to push a little further on uh, how to understand expected values. I'm going to show you two additional ways of understanding what expected values are. But in short, an expected value in uh, the context of chi-square is a cell frequency that we would expect to find if the null hypothesis is true that our two variables are independent of each other. Let's go ahead and move on to our first slide and uh, review what chi the chi-square statistic. You remember from another video and maybe from a book you've been reading that to calculate chi-square we first have to calculate the expected value in each cell in a uh, contingency table. In this example that I've drawn up here I've got men and women as my independent variable separated into three groups liberal, moderates, and conservatives. I'll have the actual values uh, for the marginal frequencies taken from my data set and then I'll go ahead and calculate the expected values f hat sub i j. Once I have the expected values I move over to the formula for the chi-square where I calculate the difference between each cell uh, expected value and actual observed value and square that difference and then I'll standardize it by dividing through by the expected value. Those are called the cell chi-squares and I sum all those values up across all the different cells. In this example I happen to have six cells so I'll sum six different uh, numbers. I then use the degrees of freedom to go to a, a chi-square table and look up my chi-square critical value and then I'm in a position to compare the chi-square calculated to the chi-square critical. If chi-square calculated exceeds chi-square critical I reject the null hypothesis. Well, I'll sh while I will show you this calculation uh, in this particular video, we're, we're spending more time on what expected values are. Let's go ahead and look at our first method of understanding what expected values are. In this example, I'm returning to the General Social Survey. That's a, a large uh, national uh, uh, survey that I like to use for doing all these example videos and my lecture videos and we're going to look at how people feel about capital punishment. Looking at the marginal distribution in 2012, we find out that 66 percent of the general social survey respondents favor capital punishment for people who've been convicted of a capital crime and 34 percent oppose that. Now if I want to compare across my independent variable and in this example I'm going to compare white respondents to black respondents to see if there's a statistically significant difference. Under the assumption of the null hypothesis, we should find 66% of the white respondents and 66% of the black respondents favoring capital punishment and 34% for both of those groups as well. If I know the number of black respondents and I know the number of white respondents, I can calculate this in a pretty straightforward fashion. So here we have um, black respondents who favor capital punishment. I had 268 black respondents and if 66 percent of them favor capital punishment I should observe approximately 176.88 black respondents who favor capital punishment. That's an expected value. Similarly for black respondents who oppose capital punishment again I have 268 black respondents in 2012 I multiply that by 0.34 and I find an expected cell frequency of 91.12 and I do the same thing for the white respondents and I can create this little table of uh, expected values. So you'll see that 902.22 white respondents who favor capital punishment is approximately 66 percent of the 1,367 people and the 176.88 uh, number of black respondents who favor capital punishment um, is approximately 66 percent of the black respondents. Now these are the expected values under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true that there's no difference between black and white respondents. Now obviously we observe a difference in the total number of cases here in our cell but that's because there's many more white respondents than black respondents but proportionally they both represent 66 percent of people who favor and 34 percent of the people who oppose. Let's go ahead and um, move on a little bit let's go ahead and calculate the chi-square statistic. Over on the right hand side you can see the actual frequency of individuals uh, in each of these categories. So the left hand table are my expected values under the assumption the null hypothesis is true and on the right hand side I have uh, the actual um, observed values. And I'm going to go ahead and create a table 
so I can calculate my chi-square. This table really, I make a table like this, it just helps me categorize or organize my data. So under categories I have my white favor, white oppose, black favor, black oppose. I lay out my observed and my expected values. And in the column labeled chi-square, I'm calculating the difference between the observed and the expected and dividing through by the expected value. Those are called the cell chi-squares. Summing them up, I get a chi-square of 46.12. Remember, my degrees of freedom here are number of cells minus 1 times the number of rows minus 1. So I have one degree of freedom. Let's go ahead and set alpha equal to 0 0.01. And let's go ahead and look at um, a chi-square table finding the row that has the correct degrees of freedom, it's the first row, and reading across to the column labeled point zero one, I find that my chi-square critical is 6.6349. In this particular example, 46.2 exceeds that value, so I reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference um, between uh, the null hypothesis and no difference, and I conclude that these two variables are associated with each other, and that white respondents tend to um, are more likely to uh, favor uh, capital punishment than black respondents. We can also show this graphically. I created this graphic in Stata. On the left hand side is the is an ex situation where we hypothesize the null hypothesis is correct. The height of those columns are both 66 percent uh, on the for the favor and 34 percent for oppose and again comparing across black and white. If we were to see that particular situation we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. On the right hand side you can see that the white respondents um, favor capital punishment that is that kind of maroonish colored column on the top left is taller than the blue column on the top right so the white respondents are favoring capital punishment uh, proportionately more than black respondents. It's the height of these columns, and I'm comparing across, I'm always comparing in this case uh, the maroon to blue, that, um, that we're interested in. The bigger the difference in the heights of those columns, the more likely we are to reject a null hypothesis. Here's another way we can understand um, our chi-square statistic and our expected values. Uh, if you've had another statistics course or if you've had some probability in any of your classes, then you'll remember that when we look at the joint probability or the probability of an intersection of two events, that we can figure out the uh, probability by looking at the individual probabilities multiplied together. Now this statement here um, says that the probability of A union B or A intersect B is equal to the probability of event A times the probability of B. The critical assumption for this particular probability calculation to work is that A and B are independent of each other. What does the null hypothesis tell us? That two events, two variables, are independent of each other. So let's go ahead and look at univariate frequency distributions. We, can, we see that from the 2012 General Social Survey, just looking at the capital punishment variable, that 66.12% of all respondents favor capital punishment, compared to 33.88% who oppose. Another way of thinking about this is, if I randomly selected a person from the General Social Survey in that year, the probability that I selected a person who favors capital punishment is 0.6612, or the probability that somebody uh, fit the opposed capital punishment is 0.3388. In the other table up there, we have our frequency distribution for race, just looking at white and black respondents. And again, thinking of this probabilistically, if I were to reach into the sample of people in 2012 and select an individual at random, the probability that they are white is 0.8361, the probability that they're black is 0.1639. So let's use those probabilities to figure out what our expected values are. If the null hypothesis is true, and I've just taken those percentages out of that table and expressed them as proportions on the bottom left, I can now calculate the joint probability. So the probability that I select an observation or a person that favors capital punishment and is white is shown in the first row, and it's equal to 0.6612 times 0.8361 or it's approximately 0.5528. In other words, the probability of chances operating, if the null hypothesis is true, of selecting a person at random who's white and favors capital punishment is 0.5528.
And I just follow that through for all my other intersections, of, uh, um, which are really the four cells of my table. I can calculate the probability of opposing capital punishment and being white, the probability of favoring capital punishment and being black, the probability of opposing capital punishment and being black. And so that final column over there, the 0 .5528 through the 0 .0556, are the probabilities I would expect to observe if these two variables are independent of each other. And that's the same thing as saying that the null hypothesis is true. I can go ahead and now use those proportions to calculate expected values. I know that if I take the total sample size, which for this year was 1,635 people, and multiply them by those individual probabilities, I'm just converting from probabilities to a number, and I can see that the 0.5528, the probability of selecting somebody at random who's white and favors capital punishment, translates into approximately 903.9 people out of the 1,367. I can keep, I'm sorry, the 1,635. And again, I just do this for every one of these categories. And now I'm in the same position I was before, where I have my expected values. I would then go uh, use it, create my observed values, count my observed values, and then calculate my chi-square statistic. Now, these two methods um, give us slightly different numbers than using the formula that I showed you right at the beginning of this um, of this video. And the reason for that is that I've got some rounding error here. I'm really not using uh, the most, I've rounded all my numbers and so they're off by a couple of people here and there, but don't let that throw you off. The, the formula that we use, um, shown on the first slide here, will give you very precise numbers because we're not using any of these fractional values. But I just want to make clear to understand that when we talk about expected values, we're really talking about creating or simulating what chance looks like. It's one state of reality in the world, and then we're going to compare what chance looks like to what we actually observe, and then make a decision about whether what we observe is similar to chance or different from chance. In this example, we can see that white respondents, are, white individuals are more likely to favor capital punishment uh, than black respondents, and that that difference is statistically significant. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope it helped you make some sense of chi-squared. It's time to move on to the next video, and we'll see you back here. Uh, and as usual, if you have any questions or comments, please let me know, and I'll do my best to answer them.